Here on the battlefield for Jesus, winning souls for Christ today. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. We're on the battlefield for Jesus. Come and join us in the fight. Though the enemy be all around us, we shall not be put to flight. By faith we know we have the victory, and no matter what the cost, we will fight to rescue hopeless sinners. Not a soul must ever be lost. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. There is a fountain Sinners plunged beneath that blood Lose all their guilty stains Lose all their guilty stains Lose all their guilty stains, all their guilty stains. And sinners plunged blood lose all their guilty stains dear dying lamb thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransom church of God be
hear your word. Lord, I ask you, Lord, to have our hearts to be open, have our ears to be open. Lord, I pray that we be edified by your word. And if someone's here today that don't know you, Lord, I pray, Lord, that they make that decision, Lord, to, to follow you. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we uh, follow your lead, Lord, and allow you to work on our hearts. Lord, I pray that we don't go on our own desires, Lord, but we ask you to light our path, Lord, and just continue to be obedient to your word. So, Lord, again, we thank you for everything you've done. Thank you, Lord, for the plan that you had for us, Lord, and, and just continue to work in our hearts, continue to work in this church. But most importantly, Lord, I pray that we be obedient to you. So, Lord, again, we thank you for everything you've done. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for um, just being uh, that, that rock-solid foundation. When we waver, Lord, someone we can go to, Lord, in any situation, Lord, I pray that someone make that decision today if they do not know you. Lord, we thank you and we honor you. And all these things I pray in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As we move forward here, how many of you all felt that hour of loss last night? Man, I felt it. <laughs> I'm still feeling it. I'm trying to wake myself up a little bit here. But we're going to move on to our books of the Bible. Books of the Bible. We're going to start off with the Old Testament, and then we're going to do the New Testament. And we're going to start with Genesis all together. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Amen. All right, now we're going to do the New Testament, starting with Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd 3rd John, Jude, and Revelations. Amen. And our verse of the week comes from the New Testament, Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. We're going to repeat after me first, then we're going to say it all together, then I'm going to have two people to see if they remember it by memory. <laughs> All right, repeat after me. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. We can do better than that. I know we, we fill in that hour, but we can do better than that. We can do better than that. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. In his, in his sight. For by the law, For by the law is, the is the knowledge of sin. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. All right, now all together. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Do we have two souls here today that has Romans chapter 3, verse 20 memorized? Just two. What about one? Jamari. Very, very close. You mixed up one word, flesh and man. I see what you did there, but we're going to use flesh for this one. Yes. as well. You 
you forgot the dare. Dare shall, dare shall no flesh. Well, let's keep, let's keep practicing. Keep, let's be ready for the next verse next week because this verse is done for until tonight. So be ready for tonight. Ushers, as you come forward, as we prepare to take up the offering, let's remember, silence our phones, silence our phones, silence our phones. All right. Brother Anderson, if you could pray for us this morning. This time, we would like to pray for those that are in the mission field, our missionaries that are left their, their homes to, to do God's will. Um, Brother Brown, can you pray for our missionaries this morning?
right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we again pray for uh, Chicago preachers. Lord, we just pray for preachers that um, carry out your gospel. Lord, we do thank you, Lord, uh, for missionaries. But Lord, we pray for more laborers and preachers of your gospel uh, right here in our own city. Lord, we pray for uh, preachers um, that are doing it for your glory. Lord, we just see these preachers that are fake, and we see how uh, they do things outwardly um, to get accolades. But Lord, we pray um, for preachers um, that are truly concerned about the souls of um, lost people. Lord, we pray for more preachers, um, Lord, that are bold. Um, Lord, we know that this world um, just pushes away preachers that just preach the truth. Um, Lord, we know that this world does not like the truth, and that whenever the truth is preached, they go against it. And so, Lord, we pray for preachers that preach the truth of your gospel. Lord, we pray for more laborers um, in this city, Lord, more laborers that will preach your word. Preach to lost souls, Lord, have a burden for them, Lord, because these things will pass away one day, and Lord, we will look to you um, in the judgment seat, Lord, and we will be judged, and so, Lord, we pray right now that you would help us, Lord, to be concerned about um, souls that are on their way to hell, and we pray for more preachers, Lord, that see that and have a zeal, Lord, um, to see souls saved, Lord, we pray for this Sunday school today that you would minister through it. We pray, Lord, that you would continue um, to bless this church and to bless your ministry. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us always, Lord, um, to be looking um, to see a lost soul um, that we can share the gospel with. We thank you. We love you. We honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. It's a privilege to have Brother Christian Schrock and his family again with us for our music clinic. We were not able to have it last year and we really missed him and missed his family and um, missed the blessing that he has been to our church. I believe now this is the third time uh, that we've had the Shrocks come to help us in the area of music. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about him in the morning service, um, but suffice it to say, a lot of good work got accomplished yesterday with our musicians and a lot more today. Uh, to go. He's going to be busy today. Um, he's going to teach our Sunday school class. And I know I said 10:15, uh, but you can go on till 10:20. So just keep on going past that mark, and, and then we'll have a little break before our morning service. But you come and teach the word. All right. Good morning. We're going to get right in here because we got some ground to cover. Let's turn in your Bibles, please, to Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to kind of lay the groundwork a little bit for the lesson this morning. I do not normally put my sermons on an iPad. Usually I'm a, a minimalist in terms of my notes. And this morning I was like, I had better get this written out because I like rabbit trails. And as much ground as we need to cover, there is no time for rabbit trails. So we are gonna, we're going to try to make this as streamlined as possible. But here in Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to look at, start at verse 8, would you please? We're going to read down through verse 11. It says, <clears throat> For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So let's uh, take out the parenthetical phrase of verse 9 here. I love parenthetical phrases, and that's why I just used one. But uh, it says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. I think a lot of times, and I'll say right out the gate, uh, some of you don't know me, and I will let you know where I stand on this. Uh, I believe that contemporary Christian music is wrong. Amen. Okay? Uh, just like me for that. We can, we can uh, agree to disagree agreeably. 
but I, can, I believe I can show you why it is wrong. But I just want you to know that's the premise we're coming from. But, myself, I've preached plenty of sermons about why it's wrong. I've preached what, you know, why is cer certain music bad? But this morning, I'm going to go a little bit, I'm a little tentative here, because it's a little scary. But, I, I absolutely believe it is biblical, what we're going to preach this morning, but so many times we focus on why CCM is bad. And we don't focus on, and I, and I think we absolutely should, but we don't go the opposite and say, well then, why is what we sing good? But here in Ephesians it says we are supposed to prove what is acceptable unto the Lord. And by doing so, then we know what we're not supposed to have fellowship with, right? If you know what is good, then you can say, oh, that's good, and that's bad, and now I'm not going to have fellowship with that. So, to do that, to, to prove what is good, okay, I'm going to take you this morning on a real short journey through history, from creation to the end times. Real short journey, right? And, of course, everything in between. Oh, by the way, we're also going to look at some physics. We're going to have a physics lesson. And we're going to have a music theory lesson. So, <clears throat> as I said, <laughs> uh, we're going to have a lot of ground to cover. But, by the end, I hope that you're going to be able to understand why I use, and I think we all should use classical music. You're like, oh boy, I don't like classical music. I feel sorry for you. You should, you should learn to love it. It's great. But why should we use classical music as the benchmark with which to compare other music? Why should we do that? Well, <clears throat> we got to cover all that ground in the next uh, 25 minutes, so buckle up, okay? But let's pray, because we need God's help this morning to help us understand and to help us get all th through everything we need. Heavenly Father, I need you this morning. I pray that you would help me, have, help me to have a clear mind. God, that it would, I would be able to communicate what you've given, uh, given me today to, to, to preach. God, help, help us all to understand from your word what we need to today about music. God, it is such a, an integral part of worshiping you. And God, we need, we, we, we need to have it right. And God, would you help us this morning again just to understand. Give me your power in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so first, the history lesson. And we've got to start at the very beginning because it's a good place to start. So if you'll turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28, <clears throat> and we're going to begin in verse 11. It says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee out as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground, I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, <clears throat> and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. I love that passage of scripture. And I'll tell you, we had over Christmas, it was disgusting in the state of Iowa, in the state house, we had a 
an idol set up. It was, a, it was an, a, a statue of Baphomet set up as a, it was disgusting, set up as a holiday display. And my pastor and I and a couple other people went down to the state house, and we didn't protest. <clears throat> we just stood in front of that statue. And it was, by the way, it was put up by the, the uh, Satanic Temple of Iowa. Okay, yeah, great stuff. And you know what we did? We read scripture in front of that thing. It was great. And we read that, we read that uh, passage right there. And I don't know, that just kind of felt good to kind of just feel like you're kicking Satan in the teeth. Amen. Letting him know that, hey, you're going down. Amen. And you're already defeated. But that's a rabbit trail, and I said I wasn't going to do that. But anyway, I want us to notice here, <clears throat> we've got this passage. God is saying, hey, I want you to take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, but obviously we're talking about Lucifer, right? And what's happening here? What, what, what did God do with Lucifer? Well, he created him. So, Satan needs to remember that he's created. So when he says, I'm going to be like God, you, he, he can't, because he was created by God. But he was created perfectly. That is hard for me to wrap my head around. Satan used to be perfect. But you know what happened? Real quick, that perfection was corrupted. That perfection was profaned. And it was defiled. <clears throat> and you know, Satan is still in the business of defiling. Amen. But I want us to think about this for a second. What is the definition of defile? It is to make unclean, to make impure. And there's a few other things, but it's all the same, along the same line. But if, I, if, if we're saying Satan defiled, he is in the business of defiling, that means he's in the business of making something unclean. So what was it before he defiled it? It was clean just like Satan, right? He was perfect until what? Until iniquity was found in him. And who was it that made iniquity get into him? It was him, right? He was lifted up with pride. And he defiled the perfection that God created. But it used to be clean, right? So we need to keep in mind that Satan takes what is clean, what is good, and messes it up. He doesn't take what's bad and mess it up. In fact, that's not defiling because you have to make it unclean. In order to defile something, you've got to make it unclean. You can't take it dirty and make it dirtier. It's already unclean, right? So we need to keep that thought in our head. We're going to come back to that. But I also want to point out that got part of the way that God created Lucifer in his perfection was in Lucifer's musical ability. You say, where is the musical ability? Well, it's, if you'll look in, <clears throat> where did it go? Verse 13, the workmanship at the end there, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. God gave Lucifer music. That doesn't mean music came from Lucifer. Music came from God. Okay? So that's a, Lucifer was an angel, but God didn't just give music to angels. He gave music to man. Look over in Genesis chapter 4 with me. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 21. <clears throat> And it says this, And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handle the harp and organ. We're just seven generations after Adam, and God gives music to man. And then if you look through the Bible, you're going to find over 500 instances of music being talked about. But beyond that, we're going to find the longest book of the Bible, the book of Psalms, 
which is the songbook of the Bible. That's a lot of songs. And you know what? <clears throat> Satan has tried to defile music. He has defiled music, just like he's defiled everything else God created perfect. Right? You're not going to find one thing that God didn't create, that God created, let's put it that right way, you're not going to find one thing that God created that Satan hasn't said, nah, we're going to twist something to make it different. Right. We're going to defile it. Right. You cannot find one thing, because Satan hates God. Right. Let's go all the way down to humans. How in the world could Satan defile humanity? And I'm not talking by sin. He did that too. But how could he twist what God created? Well, unfortunately, we're living in it. It's called transgenderism. We're going to take what God created and say, nope, I'm not that. I want to be something else. Okay? I'm not going to get on that. Man, I could get on that. But Satan defiles everything that God created. And we can find in the Bible examples of the corrupted music and the uncorrupted music. Okay? Let's look at one real quick here. <clears throat> in Exodus chapter 32, we're going to find the corrupted music. And again, remember, we're talking about corruption or defilement or profanity or whatever. It has to start with something good and twist it. Make it unclean. Exodus chapter 32, verse 4, it says, And he received them, this is Aaron, he received them, that's all the earrings and stuff, at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it, <clears throat> it, uh, after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. <clears throat> Though that calf did not bring them out of Egypt, that calf beyond the fact that it's an inanimate object, that calf didn't exist when they came out of Egypt. Okay? Keep going. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, this is a good thing to say, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Now hold on just one second there. You just made a calf that's not the Lord, and you're saying, we're going to have a feast to the Lord. Were they supposed to have feast to the Lord? Yeah, they were. Feasts of the Lord. I mean, there was a whole bunch of feasts that God showed them. But they weren't about to have a feast of the Lord. They were saying they were. But they were going to worship this calf. That's the epitome of defiling, right? You took something good and messed it up. It sounds like a lot of churches today. Oh, we're meeting to worship God. Here, let's bring in the world. Wait a second. You can't worship the world in church and call it worshiping God. You're not worshiping God anymore. You say, well, but that didn't say anything about music. Okay, well, drop down to verse 18. <clears throat> They're coming, Joshua and Moses are coming down the mountain now. He says, <clears throat> this is Moses, and he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome. But the noise of them that sing do I hear. And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh into the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and brake them beneath the mount. They were worshiping that calf, calling it a feast to the Lord, and what were they doing? Singing. That's music. That's part of the defilement. And you know that that was not godly music. That was not the music that they were normally singing. Because Joshua was like, what in the world is that noise? But you know what? Moses knew what that noise was. Because he had been around, remember where he grew up? He grew up in Pharaoh's palace, where they worshipped those gods. He was like, oh, I know that music. That takes me back. I remember what that sounds like, and that is awful. And then he comes around the corner, and he's like, oh, no. They aren't just playing the music. They're going whole hog, and they're worshiping a calf. Where did they get the idea of worshiping a calf? Egypt. 
Okay? So they're saying, oh, we're worshiping God, and they defiled it. Satan defiled them, put in their heart, and twisted something absolutely good, a feast to the Lord, and said, no, we're not going to worship the Lord. We're going to say we are, but we're worshiping the calf, and we're going to bring along the music with it. Okay? So there is an example of bad music. Man, do I have to hurry. We do also see good music. In fact, if you go back all the way to the end of the, the Bible, Revelation chapter 15. Revelation chapter 15 and verse 1. And we're going all the way to the tribulation, which is in the future. Just want to put that out there. It says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Ooh, that's cool. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. We see defiled music in Exodus, and we see absolutely pure music at the end of time. Can I tell you, Satan loves to defile. But he can't defile forever. Let's take it to sin for a minute. He messed up humanity. That's an awful lot of people. Eight billion people right now. How many people over the course of human history? An awful lot. And he defiled all of them. But he can't defile it forever. Because God said, no, I love my creation, and I'm going to send my son, and I am going to make a way for them to be made clean. Amen. Poor Satan. I feel sorry for him. Wah, wah. He defiles everything, and God says, nope, you're going to defile it, and I'm going to make it new. I'm going to make a new man. I'm going to make a new heaven and earth. I'm going to make everything new. And you know what? You can't even defile music because look here, I've got harps of God still. And my angels, the ones that stuck with me, Lucifer, are going to play those harps and sing the song of the Lamb. You can't get better music than that. Now, what happened between the time of the apostles, as in the end of what we of biblical history and now or or then and what's going to happen at the tribulation well we have to go outside the bible okay the bible doesn't give us history between you know let's say 100 a.d and now it's not you're not going to find that in the bible but we do know some things so here's our history lesson after the apostles, at the, at basically while the apostles were there, we know the Roman Empire was going on, right? And the Roman Empire lasted a few hundred years. In that time, we know that Roman Catholicism began. That is a very po important point in history. Not because it's the church. No, it's Satan's instrument of defilement, in my opinion. Amen. Amen. So we have Roman Catholicism begin and a stranglehold on society begins in the name of religion, in the name of worshiping God. They are not worshiping God at all. They say it, but they're not. Okay, so we have Roman Catholicism. Well, it starts, but eventually the Roman Empire completely collapses. Did Roman Catholicism stop? No. Neither did Satan. But the Roman Empire collapses. We go into the dark, or we can call it the Middle Ages. What is this? What, what do we know about the Middle Ages? Well, we know it's a period that's marked by spiritual, intellectual, economic decline, all perpetuated by the Catholic Church. Okay? They didn't want people to know. They didn't want literate people. They wanted to keep people dumb because they needed the stranglehold. Okay? Then we get to, and this is a rocket ride through history, okay? Renaissance, the Renaissance time. This is the time of Christopher Columbus. This is the time of Leonardo da Vinci, Martin Luther. Uh-oh, don't worry, I'm not, gonna, I'm not endorsing Martin Luther. This is the time of the invention of the printing press. 
the beginning of the scientific method that, all, that said, you know what, we need to look at what God created. They weren't going around, the, the scientific method was not created to say, we're going to prove that God is wrong. No, it was created to observe God's creation and say, wow, look at God's creation. They weren't a bunch of evolutionists. They were looking at God's creation. This is a time when people, more people, there were always people like this, but there were more people that began to question the authority of the Catholic Church. They're like, hold on. You're keeping us down so you can get rich. And so you can have all the power. You're keeping us away from God's word. That's not okay. We want to know what God said for us. We don't want you to tell us what it says. We want to read it. Amen. And you know what? They did. Under great persecution, we're talking at the very end, tail end of this, we're, we're leading up to what? Well, we have Bibles getting printed in native languages, ultimately culminating in our King James Bible. Okay? And what was going on at this time? If you go to a music history book, you don't find very much outside of, in, during this time, most of the music that, we, that they, they show is church music. That is Catholic music. And it is extremely dark. It's chant. Okay? Which is just a, a tribal uh, ritual music. That's what they did. That's what they used. And people kind of got tired of it after a while because you get a bunch of dudes singing up there not the congregation, only professional choir members were allowed to sing, and they're just boring chanting. I mean, it's boring. Well, you know, that's what you see in the history books, but what they don't tell you is that all through this time, there is absolutely music happening outside of the church, and it didn't sound anything like the stuff in the church. I don't have time to get into all of that, but, because I've got five whole minutes left, four now. After the Renaissance, we get into the Baroque and Classical era. What is this? Well, we're continuing this pursuit of knowledge. We need, we need to be more literate. Remember, at the end of the Renaissance, at, around that time of the, the, the King James Bible, we had brilliant men in this world. Absolutely brilliant men. Why? Because they were searching for God. So we, have, we come into the Baroque or the Classical era, and we, there's this continuing pursuit of knowledge both secularly and spiritually. This is the time when the pilgrims fled Europe for the New World. The music of this period is regarded as the pinnacle of tonality, that's harmony and, and, and melody and all of that, and musical form. This is where, this is where they go to study what is the, the best possible music. That's what they're looking at. Then we get into the Romantic era, or the Age of Enlightenment. We have the popularization of evolutionary thought. We have the popularization of individualism. It's all about me. It's what do I feel? What do I think? That's the opposite of knowledge. We're not going after God anymore. We're thinking, what do I feel? We have a fascination with death. They literally had suicide parties. That would be a really boring party when you're done. I feel sorry for whoever had to clean it up. They had a rebellion against authority. We had globalism. Yeah, individualism, but we had globalism. We've got everybody wants to go and see what everybody else does. You know, it really doesn't matter what everybody around the world does. What matters is what God does. Okay? We have the invention of the novel. That's a great invention. How about we have music that pushes against that tonality? Remember, we, we had this, this thing around tonality in that time. We, they push against that. They push against meter. You know why? Because it's rules. We have the, the French Revolution at this time. You know, they pushed against anything God. They said, we don't want a seven-day week. We want a ten-day week. Why would they do that? Because God set up the seven-day week. Do you think it worked for them? No. It failed miserably. Then we go, during the Romantic period, we get to Impressionism. That is, in art, we get away from trying to, be, to, to depict real things, and we say, we just want to see, just give you an idea of what it looks like. We, we go to then uh, expressionism. That is, we don't want you to try to even I, understand what you're looking at. We just want you to get a feeling inside. I'm, I'm putting 
color on a, on a canvas to create some psychological effect in you. And that followed into music. Both Impressionism and Expressionism both were in music. And what they were doing, they said, you know what, with Expressionism, they finally got to where they're saying, we're going to completely do away with any rules. It's not hierarchy. It's nothing, it's nothing that is, is rule-oriented. It's, I'm going to create it. I want to do it. Okay, we're going to, lightning speed, we've got to get through this. Come to the physics lesson. I want you, I want you to understand, when you say, when you sing a tone, or I play a tone on the piano, this, well, you know what, I'm not going to demonstrate it. I'm just going to, if you want to know the demonstration, I'll show you later. Suffice it to say this. When you play a note, there are a whole bunch of notes included in that note. And in fact, the first seven notes that are stacked on top of any note are the foundation for tonality, harmony that we know, the harmony that we use. Did, did man come up with that stack of notes? No, God did. It's creation. And I, I am going to say this. This is, we're going to put it together right here. We know that God created music. In fact, I will go this far. In Isaiah 12, 2, we can see that God didn't just create music. God is music. I have a whole sermon on that. When we go against nature, that is, whatever God created, we are, in fact, going against God himself. That is the reason that we say transgenderism is wrong, right? Okay? We know that Satan corrupts that which is not corrupt. I am going to contend this. The reason that music pushed against tonality is not a coincidence that they were going against God in every other area of life and they just randomly pushed against tonality. No, they knew that was God and they didn't want it. And now they've realized, oh, I don't like that. That's ugly. You know, the human heart is ugly. Did you know that? So when you express what the human heart is doing, it's ugly, and people don't like it. So they said, oh, we're going to stop doing that. We're just going to include everything else and, and just be uh, uh, tolerant of everything. Well, you can't be tolerant of everything. That didn't fix it. You needed to go back to what God created. I'm not saying that all classical music or even all the music of that time period is holy. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that the basis for the language of that music is God's creation. And when we deviate from what we've corrupted, I'm sorry, from that, when we deviate from God's creation, we have corrupted what God has given. So why do I think that classical music is the basis? Why should that be the benchmark? Because they pushed against it, and they said, we don't want what God wants. We want what we want. I know that's kind of, that was lightning speed. Okay, and we're one minute over, so let's pray. If you've got questions, you can absolutely ask me later. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. God, thank you that you have created pure things. God, you've never given us anything corrupt. God, help us to walk in purity. Help us uh, to walk with you. And God, help us now. In Jesus' name, amen. If you ever need anything,